Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Arthritis Talks, Decoding Arthritis Pain. I'm Dr. Sean Bevan, Chief Science Officer at Arthritis Society Canada. We've come together for this event from many different places, and I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which I am located on and on which our Toronto office stands, which is the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabek, Huron-Wendat, and Haudenosaunee Indigenous peoples. Today, this meeting place is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples, and I am so grateful to have the opportunity to live and work uh, on this land. Now, pain caused by arthritis affects millions of people each year and can really be quite debilitating. Tonight, we are very fortunate to be joined by Dr. Lisa Carleso, a physiotherapist and associate professor from Ontario, who will provide us insight into the complex world of arthritis pain. And before we get started, just a few logistics. First, this webinar is best viewed on a laptop or desktop computer. If you have any technical difficulties, please email arthritis talks at arthritis.ca for assistance. If you have a question for our presenter, please submit it through the Q&A button at the bottom middle of the screen. We'll get to as many questions as we possibly can during the hour that we have together. You can click on the chat icon in the bottom middle of the screen to access the chat and connect with other participants as well as our chat moderator. And if you find that distracting and would like to close out of the window, just click the red X icon to close out of it completely. We're also pleased to continue to provide captioning of our webinars to accommodate the diverse needs of our audience. So you'll see that running along the bottom of the page. So many questions that we received in advance follow similar themes. So we'll get to those first before going into a live Q&A at the end of the session. And before we get started, I wanna thank our event partners, Pfizer, United Way Winnipeg and others for their financial support of our Arthritis Talk series. Now with that, let's get started and a very warm welcome to today's expert, Dr. Lisa Carleso. So Dr. Carleso, before we get into some strategies around pain management, could you elaborate on what causes pain and why do people experience pain differently from each other? Sure, uh, thank you, Sean, for the question. And it's a, it's a very important question uh, and one that has a bit of a complex answer. Um, so I'm gonna do my best to try and address it as simply as possible. Um, but uh, I'm happy to answer questions at the end um, to, to help clarify things. So. Um, uh, you'll see here, uh, I'm using the example of a knee joint. I study knee osteoarthritis, and so I'll be using that um, as a, a reference point throughout my talk. And you'll see there's an icon down there at the bottom um, with a little knee joint, and there's some nerve fibers that are coming into it. And uh, those nerve fibers send signals from the joint into our spinal cord, which travels up to uh, our brain. Now, one thing I want to make uh, clear from the beginning is that the uh, association between structural changes in our joint that we see on x-ray uh, and th the felt pain, or sorry, the felt experience of pain is not very strong. Um, and so there is some evidence for some things like uh, um, uh, effusion or swelling, inflammation. And then um, there's something that we call bone marrow lesions, which they're very uh, kind of deep bone in the bone. And so it's not, um, I know many of you have probably heard the expression bone on bone, and that, that's been seen on x-ray, um, and it's not referring to that. And so um, I think it's it's just an important point because people are often concerned that when they have pain, they're doing damage to their joint. And, and so I just wanted to stress that from the beginning. So uh, coming back to the, the nerve endings, the, uh, the nerve endings carry a signal, which we call nociception. We can also refer to it as danger signals. Uh, and that goes into our spinal cord. And you can see there, I have ascending signals going up the, the back of the neck and that brings that up to the brain. And in the brain, there is um, a lot of processing of those signals that go on. It mixes that information with a lot of contextual information that we bring from our lives. So our knowledge about, for example, the disease, uh, our knowledge about pain, our beliefs about these things, 
um, our past experience with pain and injury, uh, and even our cultural background or our, our um, kind of upbringing around pain and injury and things like that. All of these things can influence our pain experience. And what happens is those things get mixed in with the actual signals from the joint. And then that information gets sent back down. And that's why I have descending signals there. And th those signals that are descending have the ability to either amplify our pain or calm it down. And that really depends on whether those thoughts, beliefs, cognitions that we're having are having more of a positive effect or a negative effect. Now, uh, if all these signals and the mixing of these um, factors, um, at, well, when that occurs, it doesn't always result in someone feeling pain. So that's important too. Just because you have these danger signals coming up doesn't mean you will feel pain. If you do feel pain, then there is, um, oops, sorry, I forgot where my pointer was. There we go. <laughs> there is um, action that occurs in the way of behavior change or uh, in our physical body. So we refer to these as protective responses. And so uh, some of the behavioral responses might be that we change the way our walk, uh, we walk. We might keep our knees stiff or we might bend it more. We might contract our muscles stronger around the joint thinking to protect it. Or we might ch choose to avoid aggravating but valued activities. Physiologically, we could see that uh, the stimulation of our sympathetic nervous system can occur. This is the part of the nervous system that responds to the flight or fright response. Uh, and it tends to ramp things up. So if it becomes engaged, it tends to ramp up our pain. And um, our nerves, they're very adaptable and they can fire more easily, sending more danger signals resulting in potentially more pain. Uh, and we can also see alterations in our muscle functioning that there can be kind of uh, ongoing tension there involuntarily, so to speak, that can affect its um, how efficiently it works for us. So as you can see, this is all very complex. There's lots of, of factors uh, working here. Now, if we take this and we try and go a step further, um, we have a current theoretical model that's been around for quite some time called the neuromatrix theory of pain. And um, it has really shaped our understanding of how pain works in our bodies for the last several decades. And it basically says that we have three different categories of inputs, uh, and then there's some outputs to, to um, address as well. So to start with, we have our, our inputs and they are in the form of cognitive evaluative uh, uh, factors. Uh, and similar to what I was saying a moment ago, this is past experiences, our personality, the attention that we give to our pain, our mood, uh, depressive symptoms can be a big factor, our beliefs about our pain and our body structures, uh, and again, culture. Then we also have um, sensory discriminative input. And so um, here we have that nociception signal that I was talking about or the danger signal, and then um, any other sensory input. So physical uh, touch, sight, hearing, smell, all of these things. Uh, lastly, we have a motivational or affective category. And this is where we have psychological stress, fear, our immune status and systemic inflammation. And so imagine that all of these different things kind of go into that circle and get all mixed up, uh, and then they result in various outputs. Uh, those are actual pain perception, the felt experience of pain, which can be emotional, physical, and psychological. Then there's action programs. Uh, so this would be like the behavior change that I said, which we often will change the way we move, behave, and communicate about our pain. And then lastly, we have the stress regulation uh, programs, which influences our stress and immune responses. So 
I hope that gives you an idea of how complex things are. It certainly um, um, makes uh, a, a good argument for why everyone's pain experience is different. There's so many factors going on and it is not identical in any one person. And, and uh, so everyone is individual in the way that they will experience pain. Uh, and as well, uh, you can imagine that this complexity makes it challenging uh, to treat pain, especially when it becomes chronic. Okay, thank you so much. That, that makes a lot of sense, Dr. Carleso. Carleso. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the clinical guidelines around pain management suggest? Sure. So again, I'm going to use um, the example of knee osteoarthritis uh, because it's the most prevalent um, joint that has osteoarthritis. And um, there we go. And uh, fortunately, there was uh, a really good summary of high quality uh, guidelines that exist for knee osteoarthritis that came out just last year. Um, and so this article looked at all these high quality guidelines. So there's, they looked at the Australian general practitioners one, the American College of Rheumatology, uh, ORSI, which is an international osteoarthritis research group, the NICE group, in the, which is in the United Kingdom, and ULAR, which is in uh, Europe. And um, what they all agree on is that at the core of the recommendations is a, a person-centered approach that uh, considers um, people's preferences uh, first. Um, and that is universal across all of them. The other thing that they have in common is that exercise, education, weight loss, and adjuncts, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, are also recommended by all of them. Um, but beyond that, there are some differences. And so I've done my best to try and, and um, summarize uh, what they kind of agree on and, and, and what the uh, recommendations were looking across the uh, categories. So if we look a little bit deeper into exercise, uh, the recommendation is that land-based exercise is more strongly favored than either aquatic or aerobic and also mind-body. Uh, in terms of education, um, there is no consensus on the content or the for format for the delivery. And equally for exercise, there is no consensus on the dosage um, as well. Now, in terms of exercise, there uh, was another uh, synthesis of the evidence uh, last year that looked at about 40 different trials of um, exercise that have been done. And they found a very small positive effect of exercise on pain and function compared to non-exercise controls. And, you know, I'll be honest, this has created quite a bit of discussion, particularly in the, in the research community, um, because of these strong recommendations that have been around for quite some time for exercise. And by no means, uh, you know, has this changed the messaging to say that we shouldn't be doing exercise because there are so many benefits to it um, that, you know, if you do try uh, exercise for your knee osteoarthritis and you don't get a good effect for your knee, you're still getting lots of good benefits for your overall health and mobility in general, both physical health, mental, emotional health. And it's so very important uh, as we age. So, um, but what it, it does uh, say and, and what is happening in the research side of things is that it's making us kind of step back and look at where we need to look uh, and do our research on exercise in the future. And um, basically, uh, I think we're going to see a shift uh, in this area compared to what we have been doing for the last several years. All right, so moving on to adjuncts, um, there was consensus on the use of walking aids as well as cognitive behavioral therapy for depressive symptoms. There was no consensus on the use of manual therapy or lateral wedges uh, or the use of heat. 
And then things that were generally recommended against include acupuncture, ultrasound, electrotherapy, unloader braces, and medial wedges. Touching on nutraceuticals, uh, all of fish oil, glucosamine, uh, chondroitin, and vitamin D were all recommended against. And moving to pharmacologics, there is um, recommendation for the use of topical and oral anti-inflammatories before injections, and the topical more so than oral, simply because the oral can be very hard on our stomachs and our systems. Uh, and um, especially as we age and we develop other um, health issues, sometimes people can't even take them. Steroids are recommended uh, in the short term, usually one or two injections, um, but beyond that, they can have uh, negative effects on the health of the joint, so they're not recommended for long-term use. PRP or uh, uh, platelet-rich plasma stem cells and hyaluronic acid or synvisc, some of you might have heard, uh, they're all generally recommended against. Acetaminophen and weak opioids, uh, the um, evidence is conflicting, and strong op opioids are recommended against. So uh, some of you might be feeling a little disheartened after that message. I know I certainly uh, was when I um, looked at that. And um, you know the reality is that we don't have any good disease modifying medications at this point in time. Uh, there are small effects for exercise and education, although some people do benefit quite a bit. Uh, and the remaining recommendations are either conflicting or everything else is recommended against. So the question is, I guess, what to do uh, in light of all this information. And I think I have some ideas about that. Okay, that's wonderful. So what about some non-pharmacological options for treating arthritis pain, Dr. Colasso? Yeah, so I'm just gonna kind of come back and summarize um, a little bit more about some of the things I just said. So again, I, I really want to emphasize that we're not saying not to exercise. Uh, it's so very important to keep our muscles strong and support the joint. Uh, it helps manage our cardiovascular health, helps manage our mental and emotional health. There's just so many uh, benefits. As well, people should be aware that when we're talking about exercise, we can easily talk about being physically active. And it doesn't mean you have to go to the gym. It doesn't mean you have to do a structured exercise program. Go for a walk, go for a hike, play pickleball, uh, ride a bike, do things that you enjoy and stay active and they will um, have uh, many benefits just, just as much as doing some specific exercises. It's important to do something that you enjoy because if you don't, we find that people don't adhere to it and they give up and then they stop doing things. So, so find something that you like to do and stick with it. In terms of education, um, there's a, been a lot of, of work looking at uh, the need for having a proper understanding of osteoarthritis. And um, it can help minimize negative beliefs and thoughts, which uh, can increase pain, which I was mentioning earlier. And um, the, the current understanding of, the, of osteoarthritis is that is, it is a disease of the whole joint. And this means that it affects many, many tissues. Uh, and it's also affected by things going on outside in, in terms of our metabolism and our inflammation in our whole body. Uh, and things, terms that you may still hear um, healthcare professionals using about bone on bone, degenerative disease of aging, things like that, uh, are really outdated and really being discouraged. Uh, the other thing um, about education is learning about pain and how we process it. And having a good understanding of pain, what it is, what it isn't, the, the weak association between um, pain and structural damage um, is important so that you don't necessarily think that when you have pain, you're causing damage to your joint. That, that just simply isn't true. 
In terms of weight loss, uh, many studies have shown that 5% weight loss can reduce loads on the knee and the hip joints, and this helps to reduce pain. Uh, there's also an emerging area of evidence looking at the contribution of body fat, and body fat uh, harbors a lot of inflammation, um, which obviously can increase pain. And so um, the, there, there is a very small body of literature on this so far, but uh, what we do know is that total body fat, elevated levels of total body fat, um, and large levels of visceral fat or abdominal fat seem to be associated with higher levels of pain. Uh, adjuncts, use of a walking aid can decrease joint loads. So there's another example of, of both with weight loss and walking aids taking loads off the joint. Uh, and then there's uh, some evidence for some over-the-counter supplements to support management of pain and disability. There was a systematic review a few years ago that demonstrated that curcumin or turmeric, uh, pycnogenol, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, it's a, it's a derivative of pine bark, uh, Boswellia serrata extract, and MSM all have uh, good effects. Now, I've, I'm, I've actually shared that article with the Arthritis Society, and there is a table within it that has recommendations for dosage. It also has safety profile information about that, and that will be shared with you all after the fact uh, for those of you who are interested in looking into these uh, natural uh, supplements a little bit further. All right, I wanna spend just a, a couple more minutes uh, talking about uh, some strategies that are very common that people use that are not helpful. And the first one is avoidance. Um, and this is natural, you know, that we all avoid things that hurt and don't feel good, but unfortunately it's not effective. And in fact, it leads to uh, more problems. Uh, so as you can see on the uh, diagram on the right, uh, where the X is, uh, when we avoid things, our activity level is very, very low and the onset of pain is also very low. And this is because we develop an overall reduced tolerance for activity. Our nervous system, uh, the threshold for sending those pain signals out also becomes lower and they send them more easily. Uh, and we lose strength. And when we lose strength, um, we don't have as much support around our joints and they will be um, impacted by those loads more easily. So avoidance is not, uh, not what we want to be doing. There's also another uh, strategy that people use, which is kind of the opposite, um, where people try and push through despite the pain. And we call this endurance coping. And this too is not effective pretty much for the opposite reason, is that it can lead to flare-ups. And when we have flare-ups, we end up in pain for quite some time, our activity levels reduce, uh, and we kind of um, start back at square one. And so here you can see that uh, on the right-hand side there that the um, activity level is a little bit higher as far as where the pain onsets, but then because we just keep pushing through we end up in this flare up and we end up in it with a similar situation where we have more pain. We end up with less uh, tolerance of activity. Those signals from our nervous system get sent out again. And importantly, we become frustrated because we get into this vicious cycle of flaring up and then avoiding and flaring up, avoiding. And um, as you recall, when I was sp speaking a moment ago about how pain is processed, our emotions and our cognitions are part of what can amplify our pain. So if we get super frustrated, that can just help to make our pain feel worse. So what do we want to do? We want to try and find this sweet spot where we can find a balance between being active and either trying to work with some pain or do some activity with very little pain. And I want to be clear that it is okay to feel some degree of pain with your exercise or with your, um, with your activities. And it is really an individual um, kind of situation where you have to figure out through a bit of trial and error, what is acceptable for you. So 
clearly if you're getting a big spike in pain where you're needing to take medication, it's keeping you up at night, you're having to rest for several days, that kind of thing, that's probably too big of a response and you need to dial back what you've been doing. But we know from our, our work that if we can find a level of activity or exercise that where we can work with the pain a little bit, we can push up our levels of activity and push back that onset of pain a little bit further so that we can be more active uh, and, and it's okay. And we aren't necessarily doing any damage, causing any, any harm to ourselves. I also just wanted to say a little bit about mind-body approaches because this all ties into this, um, um, the, these last kind of uh, different approaches that I was talking about. And it's really uh, an exciting area of research uh, that's up and coming. And the reason that mind-body approaches are having such good effect are is because we see this combination of what we refer to as bottom-up and top-down effects. So the bottom-up part really just speaks to things that are coming from our body, our muscles, et cetera. Um, and the top-down part is coming from our brain. And that's our thoughts, our, our cognitions, emotions, et cetera. And we can combine input from both of these things to have a positive effect on managing pain. And if you think about the complexity of the pain process that I was speaking about a few minutes ago, I think this makes good sense that we try and deal with it through these different strategies, through the body and through the mind. And then another benefit of it is that it also helps us deal with external stressors, life events that may happen, as well as it can um, be positively interacting with things like a, a walk in nature. Uh, and so I think um, there's lots of new and exciting um, evidence coming out about this. And I, and, and I think over the next uh, many years, we'll see lots of, of uh, strong evidence supporting this. We're already starting to see this uh, trend and change towards that. So if you've given some thought to doing some meditation, some Tai Chi, some yoga, but you haven't yet, I suggest you might want to give it a try. Okay, thank you, Dr. Carla. So I guess building on that idea, uh, what excites you about the future of pain management and treatment? Yeah, so there's a few things um, on my radar, and uh, I'll, I'll just mention them. So I, I did talk a little bit about the pain relieving effects of exercise. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're kind of having to, to step back a little bit and look at what needs to be done in that area. Um, and I think we'll see this shift towards really trying to understand the underlying mechanisms of exercise. Why does it work? How does it work? These have not been the focus of our exercise studies um, to date. And once we have those answers, we'll be able to better prescribe or build exercise that's tailored to these mechanisms underlying its effectiveness. Uh, and so, again, this will, I think we'll see this shift over the next uh, several years and hopefully have some good new ways to tackle exercise. Movement evoked pain is the second thing, um, and it is exactly what it sounds like. It's pain that we experience when we move. And this may sound uh, very simple, uh, but um, it uh, it's actually pretty complex because um, if you imagine um, that we're trying to evaluate what's going on pain-wise with someone while they're carrying out different tasks, and we've got all these, these different things to uh, keep track of, their cognitions, their emotions, things going on in their body, it gets very complicated. Historically, we have relied on just asking people about the intensity of pain that they feel uh, and we've used questionnaires to ask them about their um, activities, et cetera. Um, but this hasn't really given us a lot of information about pain that is experienced with movement. And when it comes to knee osteoarthritis in particular, there are very, there's a very mechanical aspect to that pain. 
Um, and this movement evoked pain is being starting to be widely uh, researched across many musculoskeletal conditions. Um, but I think within knee OA, because of its kind of mechanical aspect, uh, we'll hopefully start to see some very exciting uh, findings coming from there. And then lastly, um, there is a, a, a move towards combining different approaches. And so uh, for a very long time, we have studied things in silos, in, in isolation. So uh, and it's been a necessity because we need to understand how things work in and of themselves before we start pairing them with everything else. Uh, so, um, you know, we have to look at a particular medication um, very rigorously. But there's been enough work done now that we can start to pair things. So we can take a medication that we know has some effectiveness and, for example, pair it with mind-body techniques and see when we put them together, does this add up to a better effect than either one of these things in isolation? I'm particularly excited about a study that we're starting uh, later this year uh, using this approach where we're using non-invasive, um, very mild brain stimulation with yoga uh, specifically for that purpose to see if combining these things um, really helps alleviate pain. So lots of exciting things I think we'll be seeing uh, in the next several years. Yeah, very, very exciting. Thank you, Dr. Carlesso. So just before we get into some of the live Q&A from this evening, do you just have any final thoughts or recommendations for our viewers? Yeah, I think, you know, um, I'm, I'm just going to come back again to staying active and, um, you know, whether it's exercise or some type of physical activity. And even if you're, if you're not seeing the results you want for um, your hip or your knee, your foot, whatever, please try and stick with it um, uh, because it does have benefits for your whole body um, and both physically and mentally and emotionally. Uh, and it is, as I said, in terms of trying to find that sweet spot, uh, it's trial and error. Um, it takes a lot of consistency. It takes several weeks for effects to be seen. Uh, and we need to adhere to those things. And so um, you need to be a bit patient and maybe a bit methodical in your approach to, you know, how you might consider all these different factors that I've talked about. Um, a lot of these things, if you look at, if, if you were to stop and think about all the different elements that I talked about, I think you could come up with how you might be able to find uh, positive aspects within each of those things that you could bring into your daily uh, life or activity to see whether they can have a positive effect uh, on helping manage your pain. Okay, that's amazing. So let's get into some of the questions from, from this evening. Um, I'll start with, we have lots of great, great questions, so let's start here. Um, we have a number of questions here related to uh, why pain uh, symptoms might get worse at night. Do we have any understanding of why that is or how we can prevent that? Yeah, so the main reason that people have pain at night is because of inflammation. Um, and the reason that that we feel it at night when we have inflammation is because when we're sleeping, everything slows down, right? And um, so our circulation isn't moving as, as uh, fast and it's not flushing out the um, chemical irritants that come with inflammation. They tend to just sit there in the joint and then it ends up irritating the nerves, which ends up creating pain. So um, in terms of helping manage it, uh, certainly if you are uh, taking medication for your pain and, and it is effective, you can try and take it closer to your bedtime to see if that helps. Um, for people, I know a lot of people are using the Voltaren topical cream that you can put that on right before you go to bed. Um, uh, not sure in terms of, you know, try and unless you have like obvious swelling, um, to try something like heat or compression, but compression, uh, uh sorry, I meant to say ice, not heat, um, ice or compression. Um, and you could try wrapping it to to um, prevent it from getting any 
allowing any more fluid in there. Um, you could also try if you're if you're being kept awake, you can try simple things like pumping your feet to try and get your the blood flowing a little bit. But um, that, that might take a bit to to have an effect, but it'll help try and stimulate the circulation. Okay, I think you just said something that sparked another question: um, ice or heat? When you when would you use which yeah. one and why? Yeah, so. You definitely on a on a swollen joint, you don't want to be putting heat because it could uh, allow a lot more swelling in. Okay, when you apply heat to something, it opens vessels up, it dilates vessels, and allows more fluid in. Um, and so that that often will just make swelling worse. Ice is more typically recommended for swelling. Um, that being said. Um, Compression is also very effective. So, like I said, you can just take a tensor, or if you have a sleeve or something, um, that that can work as well. And what about compression socks in particular? Are they helpful to manage arthritis pain? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I um, you know, I it was funny. I I was at my massage therapist so, uh, a few weeks ago, and he started talking to me about them. Uh, because I have arthritis in my knee and he was looking at it and he's like, oh, you should try the compression socks. They're great. And, and I haven't yet. Um, and I, and I haven't seen any evidence uh, about that. Certainly, I think from a circulatory perspective and keeping things moving and, and bringing it back up qu more quickly towards the heart to be circulated, that makes sense. Whether that translates into, you know, pain management, I'm not 100% sure at this point. Okay. Um, a question here about whether you could elaborate a little bit on injections, in particular cortisone injections. And, and the question really is, why are they not recommended for long-term use? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. It's, and it's really important to, to understand. So cortisone is an extremely powerful medication. Um, and they inject it locally into the joint. So it has a very powerful local effect. And because it's so powerful, um, it can just wipe out your inflammation very dramatically. Uh, but when you use it consecutively, if you were to get multiple injections back to back, as some people do, what can happen, unfortunately, is that these powerful effects actually start to weaken the structures in our joint. And it, it'll kind of speed up some of the the um, changes that are happening to the tissue. And that's obviously the last thing that we want to happen. So kind of rule of thumb is one is good, maybe two if they're adequately spaced. Uh, but beyond that, um, you, you might be getting into some trouble. Okay. Uh, you touched on this about, you know, what to do when exercise and movement hurts, but maybe you could elaborate a little bit on you know, how do you know when it's just too much or how do you know when when to uh, listen to those body signals differently when you're really trying to exercise through pain? Yeah. Yeah. So, again, uh, this is a very individual thing. Um, and I think uh, it does take practice. Um, so. I would say, you know, uh, if if you know that walking a kilometer, for example, you get quite sore by the end of it. Um, and, and as I said, it, you know, you have to go home and take medication or you have to um, stop doing activities for a few days and it's keeping you up, et cetera. That's probably a sign that it's a bit too much. And maybe a way that you could work towards getting to that distance would be, you know, cut it in half, right? And at the very, or walk to the point where you just start to get the first little niggle of pain and then think, okay, if I'm starting to feel it now, probably the more I continue on, it's gonna get stronger. It may not, but there's a chance that it may. So maybe the, the best approach would be to turn around, go back and finish and, you'll see what your distance ends up being, right? Assess how you feel. And maybe, you know, I would suggest even writing it down kind of thing. And so you can keep track of it. 
And then if you feel okay, you could try it as soon as the next day, right? Um, if you have a little bit of pain and think, okay, that went pretty good, but maybe I'll just take it easy because I still feel it a little bit, but it doesn't seem to be interfering with anything, then, then maybe give it a day's rest. Try it again the second day. So, you know, you need to kind of think about these things a little bit and evaluate your own personal response, right? It's helpful if you re can recognize whether your tendency is to avoid activity or whether to push through activity, right? Um, and if you are someone who pushes through, then maybe start to try and rein yourself in a little bit, knowing that your tendency might be like, oh, I'll be fine. I'll just keep going. And But then you might end up being sore again, right? So it's, I think it's a combination of really trying to honestly look at the response that you're getting. Consider a multitude of factors that are going on in your life. Um, look at what your natural tendencies are and try and adjust those. Uh, and then, as I said, just kind of play with the different things and see where you can figure out where you can get to with a little bit of pain and see if you can start to push that and build up on it uh, so that you can do a little bit more without getting that pain to be uh, too much worse. Okay, super, super practical and specific, thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier about Aquafit and the question is why is it not recommended in terms of clinical guidelines? Do you know more about that? Yeah, so it's not that it's not recommended, it's just that land-based exercise are more strongly recommended. Um, so, uh, Aquafit is, um, I, I think it's great. Like, you know, it, it minimizes, um, the load on your joints, uh, and the water provides some nice resistance. Often there's, uh, classes for, uh, arthritis, uh, people, uh, in warm water, um, which is nice. So, but, um, I haven't, you know, interestingly, there hasn't been a lot of studies on it recently. Um, there was a number of studies, uh, probably, you know, many years ago now, it was a, an area of interest. And I think they just saw that the effects that it was, um, you know, the results weren't quite as strong as the compared to the other types of exercise that were being studied at the time. So it's not that it's it doesn't work. Um, it's just that you know when we're looking at study results and we're looking at the average of all the people doing the program, um, the effects weren't as strong. So if you are a person who likes the water, you're a swimmer, you're you're you know enjoy that. Uh, as I said, it's important to do something you enjoy. Um, so by all means, I think uh, give Aquafit a try. Okay, great. Um... I know this is a complicated question, so maybe at a high level, um, someone's asking about how are clinical guidelines created and what's involved in that process? Oh boy, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I have not been privy to that inside um, um, uh, mechanism, shall I say, but there is um, some discrepancy in the way that they are um, uh, created, which is why they come up with some different recommendations and different results. Uh, often they use a panel of experts. Uh, so in the case of arthritis, there will be lots of uh, rheumatologists and medical professionals. Um, and then they also bring in people who are experts um, in research, uh, in evaluating the literature. And, um, and then, yeah, Beyond that, they have each of them have different processes that they use. I think combinations of like how much they weight their expert opinion with the evidence to come up with these things, and that's why there's there's some uh, differences in what one guideline might say over the other. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have a few questions here about nutrition, so maybe could you touch on how does it come into play when it comes to managing arthritis pain and you know, do we know anything about certain foods? And I know we've done other webinars on this, but would appreciate your thoughts here as well. Yeah, so um, 
I, I don't, I'll be honest, I don't have a ton of detailed knowledge about this. I know that there has been a number of studies looking at inflammatory foods or those nightshade vegetables in particular, um, that I, uh, to my knowledge, the evidence is kind of mixed about them. Um, they were hopeful that, um, you know, it was going to have a positive effect. And I think we've seen studies that that do show that, but then there's equally ones that that don't. Um, and uh, I know that I think that you guys had a, a webinar on uh, uh, nutritional aspects. So, so the the expert that you brought on there is probably uh, better to speak to that um, than me. But the other thing I will say is that um, uh, there is a very exciting area of research that's just uh, rapidly progressing on the microbiome. Uh, so looking at our gut health, and that is very much related to the types of foods that we eat. Uh, and it is just at the very early stages. Um, and I think, you know, it'll probably be the better part of uh, the next decade or so before we see some, some real um, kind of tangible results. Uh, it's a very complex area, um, but there's a lot of excitement around it because it's this whole new extension uh, as far as kind of nutrition is concerned and looking at our, our our gut health. So so hopefully some exciting things to come there. Okay. How can you tell if pain is from overuse of a joint or something else? Yeah, um, so I'm not sure what something else might be, but overuse would be um, if you do something that, I, I would say if you're having pain while you're doing something immediately uh, and that pain continues to increase while you're doing it, if you continue to do it, um, that's probably a good sign that you might be overdoing it. Um, because you you might end up paying more for it after the fact. Equally, just because you don't have pain when you do something, if you have a strong pain response after the fact, that might also be related. And that's a little bit more tricky to figure out, um, but it could be related to kind of a, a delayed inflammatory response that, for example, could be um, you could be feeling at night. Um, so I know for myself, um, you know, if I go and do a big hike and I can be fairly comfortable during that hike, but then several hours later, I can end up in a fair bit of discomfort if I've kind of gone too far with it. So, so again, it's, it's partly trying to be, um, cognizant of what you've done, how much you've done, being aware of all these different things that could be affecting uh, your pain, right? Your stress levels, your emotions, different things going on um, and accounting for those and, and, um, and then trying to, I guess, link uh, them to see if they could be partly explaining uh, your pain that particular instance. Okay. Um, what about stretching? Is stretching helpful for arthritis pain? So stretching, um, uh, not to my knowledge, not a lot on stretching. Um, more so, I would, I would phrase it more as mobility in the sense that you want to try and maintain as much movement in your joints as possible. Um, stretching does come into play with some of that. And again, not to say that stretching isn't helpful, um, but, you know, does static stretching make a huge difference? Uh, I would say probably not. Within the context of something like yoga, where you're doing, you're in positions that you're certainly putting certain muscles on a stretch, but there's also uh, a component of strength, a component of mobility, that, that has more beneficial effects because it's combining these different aspects than just static stretching in and of itself. Um, but uh, yeah, 
you definitely want to try and maintain your mobility, like maintain as much bend in your knee, uh, try and keep your knee um, uh, extension, the ability for it to fully straighten as much as possible. Uh, but you can do that simply by, you know, putting your leg up on the coffee table um, for uh, a few minutes each day kind of thing. If you think that your knee is stiffening and you're lacking some extension, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be stretching your hamstrings constantly. <laughs> okay. So you just mentioned yoga. Uh, there's yeah. a question here about, is there any evidence to support Pilates to help manage arthritis pain? Um, there is a little bit. It's, uh, I would say there's even less evidence about Pilates than there is about yoga and Tai Chi. Um, Pilates, um, has, uh, for those of you who may be familiar, it has a bit of a core strengthening focus and, and mobility as well. Um, there's probably a little less of a that mind body component than with the tai chi and the yoga so i think that's probably um one of the main differences that i see i think the exercise portion of it is is potentially quite good but it's doesn't have that as, as strong a mind body um connection and that could be the difference between the effectiveness of these these different types of exercise. So you touched on this too when you were talking about some of your future research. So I'll just ask you the question and you can maybe elaborate, but you know, what about mindfulness? Can that help with arthritis pain? Yeah. So um I I will say yes because that's part of uh, a study that we're currently doing. Um, and, uh, we're seeing some really good effects and, uh, people are, are making some, some great comments about how they are able to use what we're teaching them. Not only is it helping their, uh, them manage their pain in their knee, it's helping them manage pain elsewhere in their body. It's helping them manage stress in their lives. It's helping them manage you know, tense interactions with their family members or their spouse or all kinds of different things. Um, and so it really has this great um, kind of universal effect that people can bring in to their lives and apply across a number of different things. Okay. So there are a number of people here who are obviously trying to manage arthritis in their hands. So mm -hmm. questions about whether there are any specific pain management approaches that we know of to manage uh, arthritis in the hands. Yeah, so the hands uh, are probably, I think after the hip and the knee, they're in the next common joint that are affected. Um, but it is quite a different area. As you might imagine, you know, we've got very small joints and, and they move in different ways. The muscles are different, the tendons are small. Um, and the recommendations around them in terms of the guidelines are a little bit different too. Uh, and so th things like uh, splints or little braces um, uh, are helpful. Um, exercise, of course, is recommended. But I know there are some differences in terms of some of the medication and some of um, the... Um, the adjuncts like acupuncture and um, heat and things like that. So it's not exactly the same. Um, and it's important to kind of look, uh, probably look at a specific guideline for, for hand osteoarthritis um, because it is a little bit different. Uh, and and, and uh, yeah, they're, they're kind of having to work uh, through some of the different issues in, in trying to understand pain and function related to the hand versus the hip and the knee. Okay. So you mentioned Voltaren earlier. So there's a general question here about whether topical creams are safe to try for arthritis pain. Yeah. So Voltaren is the main one and um, it works very well, which is why it is uh, recommended uh, in the, in the guidelines. Um, I use it myself. I, I find it very helpful. Um, and in terms of other topical creams, uh, I'm less aware of them and, and, uh, they, they have not been, uh, recommended. I know there's a lot of creams 
any of the creams that kind of um, make your skin tingle a little bit, <laughs> and um, they tend to be, um, they try to kind of distract your your nervous system a little bit, but without having a real true effect. And it doesn't really last very long or kind of get into very, you know, deep into the area the same way that say the Voltaren, which has, it's, it's a medicated cream uh, would do. So, um, so yeah, so the, the, the kind of non-medicated creams, um, if you're not finding them that effective, that's probably why, because they just kind of work much more superficially. Okay. Uh, what do we know about arthritis pain and the weather? Yeah, that's a bit of a mixed bag as well. <laughs> um, I just saw not uh, just in the last few weeks, uh, a colleague of mine down in Australia actually did a a big study looking at this very topic about uh, arthritis pain and and the weather. And I think they um, used like a database of you know several tens of thousands of people. I think it was in Europe, um, and found that there was no effects of the weather. Um, that being said, I have seen other studies that have found uh, an effect, particularly related to humidity. Um, and so, you know, I don't think we have an answer about it right now. Um, and I, it'll, I think, continue to be studied until we have a more consistent uh, response. So, um, you know, at this point, I would say if you are someone that feels affected by the weather, that that is something uh, you should account for when trying to, for example, if you're thinking about um, being, you know, doing a particular activity in the summer and then the humidity is high and you know that the humidity affects you, then try and plan appropriately or in terms of when, you know, can you do it earlier in the morning when it's not so bad out or Maybe you don't do as much because you know that the humidity is going to be hard on you, right? So you should definitely try and account for, for things uh, as much as you can that way. Okay. Uh, there's a question here about splints and whether splinting can help alleviate some arthritis pain. Uh, yes, definitely in the hand. Um, it is used uh, commonly, especially for the thumb. The thumb is a very... Um, multi-axial joint. It has lots of movement in it and um, it doesn't have as much uh, support because of that. And so uh, when it becomes arthritic, it can become difficult uh, to have that support. And so splinting the thumb um, can be quite effective uh, to provide that support. Um, and equally, little splints can be uh, made for the fingers as well. Um, and I, I think because the word splint was used, I'm, I'm not taking the question to be asking about kind of more larger braces for, you know, the knee, for example. So I think I have time for one last question. And the question really is, is are all the approaches that you'd be talking about this evening related to both pain from inflammatory arthritis and osteoarthritis, or would they be distinct? Yeah, so there, there would be some distinction um, in that inflammatory arthritis and osteoarthritis are different. Osteoarthritis has an inflammatory component, but it's very low grade in comparison. Um, the inflammatory arthritis a lot of that pain is driven by that inflammation and it uh, often affects multiple joints that become red, hot, and swollen. That being said, you can still, you know, the pain experience is still the same as far as all those different factors that I talked about. And you can still apply those principles very much to, to really anything. It it's almost doesn't matter what is causing the pain, you can look at those, you know, cognitive factors, the physiological factors, those nervous system factors, emotions, all those things, right? 
um, because they can have uh, an important influence on the pain experience. It is very much an experience of the mind and of the body. Well, with that, Dr. Carlesso, thank you so much again for sharing your knowledge with us today. Uh, we'd like to take just a few moments to get the audience's feedback on today's presentation. So for those of you on Zoom, you'll see a poll question come up on your screen with some answer options. So click on the response that reflects your thoughts. I feel more knowledgeable and empowered after attending this webinar. We will also be sending you an evaluation form when we email the recording and the slides. So if you weren't able to access that poll question, you'll have the chance to give us feedback then. And we really do use the survey feedback to shape future arthritis talks, and we really, really do value your input. Also, with the help of volunteers who have lived experience, we have expanded our Arthritis Connections online peer support groups. And we now offer sessions on a variety of topics on different days and times each month. So to learn more about them and find a session to attend that suits your schedule, visit arthritis.ca slash connections. Once again, we are so grateful to Pfizer, United Way Winnipeg, and others for their financial support of this event. This concludes tonight's Arthritis Talks. On behalf of all of us, thank you so much for joining us today. Please stay well. <laughs>